Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Udick, and today you are in for a real treat as my guest, Michelle Cassarola, drops all sorts of knowledge around structuring writing in a generative AI world. As we get ready to dive into today's episode, I want you to either find a rubric you use with students or if you happen to be in a car driving, have one in your mind's eye as we get into today's episode. As Michelle talks about the changes she is making in her college ELA and writing courses, I want you to think about what changes you might need to make to your own rubrics. She'll share her five new writing criteria in this episode. Michelle will be discussing some groundbreaking ways AI is being integrated into higher education. We'll look at how it's transforming assignments, assessments, and the overall approach to teaching English composition. Plus, we'll talk about the importance of AI literacy for both students and educators. Before we dive in, however, I want to remind you to check out all the free resources over at ShiftingSchools.com. We have loads of free guides and courses over there for you. Also, a quick reminder that Trisha and I are both full-time consultants. So if your school or organization is looking for some customized trainings around generative AI, well, we're here to support. In fact, right now, we're in the middle of a five-part virtual webinar series with educators across the state of Alaska, diving deep into how generative AI tools can help and support some of our most remote places in America. Just head over to shiftingschools.com and fill out the contact form to see how we can support your organization as well. But before we jump into today's conversation with Michelle, here is a quick word from today's show sponsor. Discover the power of acknowledgement with Libra. In a world where every staff member's dedication shapes the future, recognizing their efforts becomes our mission. Libra transforms your school into a place where achievements, big and small, are celebrated daily, creating a ripple effect of motivation and pride. Join the recognition revolution with Libra, where every achievement is a cause for celebration. For more information and a free demo, contact me at jeff at shiftingschools.com today. All right. And with that, today's guest is Dr. Michelle Cosarola, an associate professor of English at Georgia State University, the Perimeter College. She, along with her colleague, has pioneered the integration of AI and Composition 1 and 2 courses. Michelle has a wealth of experience, having served on the AI expert panel at EduCause and leading the AI Literacy Committee, where she's creating AI literacy standards for higher education. She's also the recipient of the Seta Low Fellowship and is currently co-authoring a textbook and several peer-reviewed papers. And let's not forget, she's also the mother of eight amazing boys. You are in for a mind-bending episode and make sure you check out the show notes for all the resources that Michelle shares with us in this one. You're going to enjoy it. And with that, on with the show. All right, welcome back to the Shifting Schools podcast. I am so excited to continue our series here on generative AI in higher ed, how different professors and university teachers and educators are leveraging AI in higher education to support us as K-12 educators in the work that we do with students in the K-12 world. I'm so excited today uh, to have Michelle with us. She's a PhD and Associate Professor of English at Georgia State University. Michelle, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. So my name is Michelle Casorla, and I've worked with Eugenia Novok Shinova, who could not be here today. I wish she was. She's my colleague, and she's the other half of my brain, seriously. <laughs> so that. we've done some really great research and some really great in-the-classroom stuff. 
that taught us a lot about using generative AI in the classroom. We were classroom teachers primarily, not researchers. But we did have a lot of SOTL, which is the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Research, out of our classes. So we decided last summer that we were going to teach only with AI for a whole year and see what happened. And the way that we had to redo our classes and the way that we had to rethink our classes, because we teach writing, I'm an English professor, was transformative. It was amazing. And the stuff that we learned, it's just been a really incredible year. And I'm looking forward to next year doing the same thing. Yeah, and I'm so excited to dig into some of this because I think throughout this series, we've learned so many little tips and tricks that professors like you have been doing that were, I know that there are English ELA teachers, social studies teachers who listen to this podcast are like, oh, I could do that with my 11th and 12th graders. A little adjustment, we can do that. I want to get started with our conversation today is uh, over at Educase, you wrote Teaching with Gen AI in mind where you talk about this. And I want to start with this quote out of this, a great research. We'll link to it in the show notes for everybody that wants to go over and read that. But so here's what you wrote. You wrote, quote, the world of teaching that we knew before November 22, 22nd, 2022 will never return. So ignoring generative AI, pleading with your students not to use it, and then trying to police them is a terrible waste of time, end quote. It is. Where would you like to see more higher ed folks focused when it comes to teaching with AI this year? And talk about what might this mean for us here in K-12? Okay, for higher ed and K-12, I'll talk about both of those because my heart is with the high school teachers. I have so much respect and so much just awe of what they do. So I have to start there. What we do isn't that different. I'm teaching English. So the big question was, when we started this whole project, if AI can do English, where are we? Who are we? What can we do? So a lot of people are turning their eyes to trying to do AI detection, which Mm. I'm just going to say is a waste of time. And it's also opening a lot of really bad learning outcomes with your students because, okay, the way that we approach this, and, and I have to give Eugenia a lot of credit here, is she thinks of things in a backwards way. Mm. So she said to herself, what are employers going to be looking for in that. the age of AI? And so then I jumped on that and we started getting ready for how we were going to assess our students. And one of the biggest parts of this has to be assessment. So when you're thinking about how you're going to teach with AI, you have to start with assessment. Mm. And so we can't assess things like grammar, punctuation, spelling anymore. Okay, let's take that off the table. Let's be free of it. Let's just think of it as being free of it. Okay, I am tired about teaching dangling modifiers and split infinitives. I don't want to teach them anymore. Yeah. Can we just let go of it? Can just free yourself. Free yourself of that. Okay. (laughs) Think about the 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 idea that generative AI can do that. So I don't have to think about that anymore. I don't have to worry that I have a student who came in with ESL skills Hmm. or who has has a, a family that's in the army and had to move every four months and never really learned how to write. I don't have to worry about that anymore. I have someone who can plug in a tool that's going to help them organize and structure an essay. Now, what is there left for me? Okay, so let's start to think about that. What is an employer going to want? The first thing the employer is going to want is facts. Mm. Everything has to be factual. So I hallucinates. And if it doesn't know where to find something, it will make it up. Yeah. So you have to make your students realize that AI will hallucinate. You cannot write anything or about anything that you don't know, because if you don't know it, you don't know if AI is hallucinating. And if you're turning it into me, I do know it. So I will be able to tell that AI hallucinated (laughs) and you will get an F. Okay. so that is not okay. So the first thing you have to talk to with your students is. AI hallucinates, okay? You have to have the facts and the facts have to be accurate. The second thing is they have to be transparent. And this is really hard for your students. You have to start at the very beginning of the year. Say, 
I don't mind if you use AI and your students will go, what? <laughs> and then you say, but you have to tell me that you use AI. Okay. Now, this is the carrot and the stick. If something is hallucinated and I signed it and you haven't been transparent with me, I will give you an F and you mm. can't make it up. Mm. But if it hallucinated something and I find it and I give you an F, if you were transparent with me, I will now teach you how to use AI effectively and then I will let you redo it. Turn it into so a that's moment. the carrot oh, yeah. and the stick. Yeah, that's the real thing that you want to do with your students as far as transparency. And they just need to tell you, this is how I used it, where I used it, and most importantly, why I mm. used it. I love that. And I think we are hearing this. I'm so glad you said that because in almost every interview I'm doing with professors like yourself, that transparency piece is for me, I used to call it shining a light on the cockroaches. If we pretend <laughs> it's not there and you let the cockroaches go and do their thing, they're going to figure out ways to get around AI detectors. And, and we just like to pretend it's not going to happen. Versus if we actually embrace it, like you said, and say, we can, you can use Gen AI in my classroom, but we're going to put guidelines and responsibilities around its use. And one of those responsibilities is be transparent about it. Yes. No. And you own what you turn into. And you own so what you turn into. it better be right. That's right. It better be right. You better yeah. be really careful. And so it's causing my students to go, do I have to write this with AI? Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're like, care. I don't want to use AI because I know I'm responsible <laughs> for what I say. Yeah, that's exactly. so great. Now, the third thing that we want is we want to really pay attention all the way through class to things that we've always paid attention to, mm. which is voice mm. and tone and audience. So what is an employer going to want? They're going to want anything you write to sound human. Yes. So if it doesn't sound human, I will give you a bad grade, not because you used AI. In fact, we've taken AI completely off of our rubrics. We don't even mention it. We mm. say, did you have the right voice and tone for this project? It, did it speak to your audience? Okay. So if their audience is, is ninth grade students, for example. Right. Okay. And they're using all these crazy $5 <laughs> words, which AI likes to stick in, yeah. especially nuance and leverage. Yeah. I hate those two words now. <laughs> I just hate them. Okay. Delve is if the one the, that I always get. I always oh, and get Delve. Delve. Oh my God. And Delve. <laughs> okay. So if they're using those kind of words and it's not a vocabulary lesson, mm -hmm. then they are using incorrect words for their audience, their tone, and for their own voice. They have to have their own voice. So you really have to spend a lot of time teaching these students, what does voice mean? Yes. And a lot of times it's hard for us to even think about what does voice mean. But one of my students put it beautifully last week. He did a reflection for my class and he said, I realize voice is my personal branding. Mm, it's oh, what makes that. my writing mine. My and so I'm, talk, about, talk to a generation that understands personal branding. Right. So if it isn't your personal brand, if you are not communicating your personal brand, then you are not going to get a good grade in my class. Mm. And I don't care whether you used AI or not. That's not the conversation. The conversation is, did you use your own personal brand, the correct tone, and did you write it for this particular audience? And if you did, I don't care whether you used it or not. So what I love about this, and I just want to break this down because I've already got this in my mind. If I'm an ELA teacher listening to this and I use a rubric to assess student learning, I need to take off conventions. We're not yes. worried about periods and misspelling. No. AI can take care of that. And not even Gen AI, red underline words, that's Grammarly. Like we've had a lot right. of those programs for a long time. Take that off your rubric. And in place right. of that, you're going to add voice, audience, and tone. Yeah, that's and what factual. We be, if and it's factual. factual. Is it mm -hmm. factual? It, yeah. Is it, it correct? Were you transparent? Transparent okay. in your use of tools. And then you also have to make sure that the students are following your instructions. Mm. Okay, that's another thing employers are going to want. Did you follow the instructions exactly? And if you did not, then you are not getting a good grade in my class. So we make our instructions very difficult because we know that they're probably gonna use AI. So yeah. if you have instructions that just say, 
write me an analysis of, I don't know, of, of this book, right? Yeah. Whatever book it is, yeah. write me an analysis. AI hey, can do that like that. Yeah. Okay. But if you say, start with an introduction that tells me about yourself and mm. how you relate to this book, then mm. transition into this. Then the first paragraph, I want you to, to use this source in this way. And the second paragraph, I want you to use that source in that way. Mm. So our, our instructions are very complex. And it's because it's harder to do with AI than it is to do without AI. I love that. So this the instructions have to be really explicit mm. and they have to be very careful. So did you follow the instructions? Does it have the right voice, tone, and audience? Did you, is it transparent? Okay, is it factual? And that's our rubric, basically. I, and we also add format. Did you format it correctly? Because we yeah. have specific formatting that we want, and it has to be MLA formatting and double spaced. It has to have citations. The citations have to be correct, and MLA citations cannot be done with AI at this time. Mm. So if you're asking for if you're asking for APA citations, yeah, it can totally do APA citations. Oh, wow. It cannot do MLA. Cannot that's do interesting. MLA. Huh. I think that is such great. You're just, you're dropping knowledge all over the place. I love this because to your point, and this is something that I think a lot of teachers are struggling with is prior to November 22nd, 2022, I could tell students, write a five paragraph essay on name a book. And I could pretty much believe that most of the stuff that was in there, they had to do, like they had to dig in. Yeah. Since November 22nd, if your instructions are nothing more than write a paper about X, Y, and Z, and you don't set up the structures around that, of course, they're going to use generative AI because that's yeah. what everybody's going to do when your instructions are so loose. I love right. this idea of getting very specific about exactly what you want in the paper. Um, We've also so been great. really careful about formative assessment. Finally, college professors are listening to our educators. <laughs> You've always been telling us to use formative assessment, and we have totally ignored you because we were lazy. <laughs> so now we have to get back. We have to, to get in line with you and figure out stuff that you've been using forever and understand formative assessment is really super important. So we have scaffolded every single assignment so that they're doing a little bit of this, 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 leading to a larger assignment. Now, one of the reasons we do that is, first of all, we want them to use AI and we want to show them how to use AI all the way through. Right. But the second reason is if you have a winner take all assignment at the end of the semester, you're just you're throwing them to the wolves. They're going to yeah. want to use AI because it's just sitting there and it's yeah. handy and it's beautiful yeah. and they want it. So don't use that. Use use structured scaffolded assignment. We give every single assignment the same points. We give mm. 10 points for every assignment, whether it's a discussion assignment or whether it is a research paper. It's 10 mm. points. Why? Because that. the research paper has been carefully scaffolded all the way through. So they don't have any reason to want to do that mm. win or take all assignment. With How much time are you spending, say, at the beginning of a semester, or the beginning of a quarter? How much time are you spending actually having to support students and, and teach students how to leverage AI? Are you having to spend a lot of time on that through discussions, through classwork? How much time is it taking you at this point? So we have a, a couple of prompts that we've already written and we okay. stick them into our course. So we have in our syllabus, we have an AI statement that says, this is when you can use AI and this is when you can't use AI. Mm. I highly recommend to use uh, a red, green, and yellow for your assignments. So red means no AI, yellow means you can use some AI, but not all of it. And then green means you go for it, baby. Use as much that. AI as you want. And so, <laughs> and so that's really clear to them. And also to be really clear about what AI is, because a mm. lot of students don't understand what the difference is between a chat GPT and Grammarly and what they're getting from Microsoft. And right. frankly, we never use an AI detector because it's very dangerous and it's very bad to the learning environment because what you're doing is you're saying, I gotcha. Yeah. We have to stop being policemen and start yeah. being teachers yeah. again. And 
Yeah. And I agree with you. And I'll just remind everybody, I, I help to write and facilitate the writing of the K-12 guidance here in Washington state. Inside that guidance, if you were to download it, we have the AI matrix that you talk about, the red, green, and yellow. We actually have a five-step matrix instead of a three-step matrix, but oh, you nice. can turn it into a three, three-step three matrix. So I think that's a huge piece. And, and know that those resources are already out there for teachers. You don't have to go make it up. But I do agree with you. And that's the work that I've been doing is saying step number one is get that matrix in in place, whether it's a uh, red, green, yellow, or you decide to go with five, three, it doesn't matter, but get that matrix in place and support students in understanding what do I, when I say yellow, what does that look like? What mm-hmm. does that mean? When I say green, go for it. It means go for it, figure out and leverage it in ways to scaffold your own learning in ways to support you in writing an outline for a paper, whatever it might be. There's moments like that, that I think are, are very powerful for it to use. So uh, just know these resources are out there for you. We have to support our colleagues as well. A lot of our colleagues are not ready to move into AI. Yeah. And so we have to say to our students, this is good for my class. It is not good for someone else's class. You have to understand that Uh, because uh, Mr. What's his name or Ms. What's her face? Yeah. They may not be ready for this. So let's just keep it in my class and you do what I say in my class, you do what they say in their class and really support your colleagues because trying to push them before they're ready is just not going to help us. I love that. Thank you for tuning into Shifting Schools. Let's pause our discussion to spotlight Libra HQ, a breakthrough in using AI to deepen connections within organizations. Imagine an environment where every staff member feels truly seen and valued. This is the heart of Libra's mission. Libra transforms how leaders celebrate and recognize the personal and professional milestones of their team members. It's not just about reminders. Libra's AI dives deeper, offering insight into enhanced team cohesion and promote a culture where support and acknowledgement are paramount. Picture a school where every individual is acknowledged, from work achievements to personal victories, creating a culture of appreciation in just minutes a day. In these challenging times, where the demands on educators have never been higher, Libra offers a way for school leaders to lead with true empathy and compassion, ensuring every team member feels an integral part of their community's success. Discover how Libra can revolutionize your school's culture. For a demo, contact me at jeff at shiftingschools.com. Let's build a future where every educator and staff member feels connected and valued. And now let's get back to our conversation. I want to switch gears a little bit. We can keep talking about this. You and I, we, this is like four oh, more yeah. hours of podcasting. Just oh, we can, we could, alone. we could totally. <laughs> but I do want to, I do want to move on here because one of the things I think that we're on the cusp of looking at in K-12 and, it, and you're already doing this work is you're working on developing AI literacy standards for higher education. Mm-hmm. Can you right. give us an example of those standards and what do you think K-12 educators should be more aware of as you're creating these standards? This is where I feel like I'm starting to be, for better or for worse, drug into that area as a consultant in K-12, as people are like, where are these standards coming from? So I'd love to hear what you're working on. So I'm the chair of the Literacy Standards Committee for EDUCAUSE, and EDUCAUSE is an organization that um, deals with higher ed um, and technology. So it's a really great organization. So I started working with them and somehow I ended up with the chair of the AI Literacy Committee. (laughs) But I'm working with some really incredibly, astonishingly amazing people who really know their stuff technologically. Mm. So there's, first of all, there's two areas of AI that we have to pay attention to. There's scientific AI and then there's generative AI. Mm -hmm. So generative AI, when I talk about that's using chat GPT and stuff like that. The scientific AI building learning large language models, creating machine learning systems. That is way beyond my purview. That is not (laughs) something I know. Yeah. But that is part of the AI literacy model. Mm. So one of the things that we need to pay attention to is that our students need to learn how these models work Mm -hmm. so that they know that they're not some kind of magic machine and that they don't really know things. Right. They can only pull from the knowledge that we have put in and through the algorithms that we have set up. So they need to understand privacy. They need to understand technology. The privacy issue is very important. We don't want to share anything that is private 
on an AI system because it will be folded into the model and we don't know where it's going to come out. We have to be very careful with the way that we we talk about stuff. If you want to get resume stuff, that's fine. But don't feed your address and your phone number in there yeah. because that'll get stuck folded into a model and you don't want that to be there. Mm-hmm. So we have to talk about privacy with our students and how dangerous It is. Cybersecurity is super important. So they have to understand cybersecurity. Also, our colleagues and we need to understand how it works, why it works, and the cybersecurity issues behind it. We have to understand fallacies. We have to understand bias because it will bias. It will tell us things with a bias. As Emily Dickinson said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. It is not telling it the truth. Uh, it is telling it very slant. So we have to make our students aware of the kinds of biases that are existent in the models, that it is not gospel. They should not take it as such. And we need to do our own research. We need to make sure that what we're hearing is actually what is. Mm -hmm. So these are really important things with AI literacy. That's great. And are are you starting to teach those in your class? Are these constant conversations? Like I'm trying to figure out in your class, and I'm just trying to think of a teacher, does a teacher need (laughs) to take one week and focus just on AI literacy? Or is this a constant conversation throughout the course of your class? Like you're just constantly folding in this knowledge as we are progressing through the learning. It's it's a constant conversation, but sometimes it just peaks out at strange times. We have an AI playground that we have. And one of the things is our student, we asked our students to ask three different models tell me a Jewish joke, Mm -hmm. okay, to see how the model would handle ethnicity Mm -hmm. and to understand how it does that. Strangely enough, a lot of the class got, it's not polite to to use ethnic humor. They got those those kind of answers. But the Jewish student and Mm -hmm. I, because I'm Jewish, got Yeah. Have you heard about the rabbi who, you know, interesting. So we got a Jewish joke and that kind of freaked everybody out because, oh, my goodness, this model knows something about me and I'm just on it. Of -hmm. course, Gemini, for example, is run by Google. Meta is run by Facebook. They know more about stuff than. Yeah. That's so, that's such a great, I love that. And I think you're absolutely right is especially those two for better, for worse, Gemini is going to have a lot. If you're logged into your Google account, they've got a lot of information about you. Yes, they do. There's also power in that. There's a reason why every time you Google something is exactly what you were looking for because they know. But on the opposite end of that, you're right. It's going to be very fascinating as we go into these models on that kind of stuff. Wow, that is incredible. That's so nuts. Last question here as as we move along. In your newsletter, and we're going to have a link to the newsletter here as well where people can go and sign up and, and get your newsletter. But in your newsletter, you wrote, quote, generative AI opens up our opportunity to teach real writing. Yes, Can it you does. expand on that and talk more about how your practice has changed through experimenting with Gen AI? And what do you mean by our opportunity to teach real writing? Okay, so we don't have to teach dangling modifiers anymore. I don't have to teach how to organize a paragraph anymore. Yeah. So now I can teach how do we research a topic? How yeah. do you find a correct topic, and also using generative AI models to find and narrow topics, because that's Mm -hmm. a big problem with students. They'll find this giant thing, or they'll go to ProCon and just choose a topic. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) We don't want them to do that. We want them to think. And so what we've found is that when we start forcing our students. So let's start with that. Okay. This is what we did. This is very sneaky. But at the beginning of the class, we told, I hope none of our students are listening. (laughs) At the beginning of the class, we tell our students, use a generative AI image Mm. creator to show two things that you like to do, two interests that you have in your life and put them together in one picture. For example, we have a, 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 a guy holding a a trout and trying to play chess, okay? Because his two interests are (laughs) fishing and chess, okay? So we got some really interesting things. We had one student call, she she called it one subject, two needles, 
and she's mm. really interested in tattoo art and in sewing. Okay. So we got these really amazing cool. introductions we would never have normally gotten. Now, cool. why am I telling you this? Because then we told them they had to do their research project on one of the two interests they showed mm. in that image. Mm -hmm. Okay, they can't go looking for something else. So the young woman who did who did tattooing and sewing did a research project on the history of tattoos, for example. Cool. And the, the kid with the chest and the trout did it on some of the, what are some of the most interesting chess moves mm. historically and when did they occur and how oh, did they wow. develop? So the way that they did that is they, first they put into perplexity. I don't know if perplexity.ai, yeah. mm -hmm. amazing. Okay, so they took their topic and they put it into perplexity. We had them stick the per topic in there and say, give me, five ideas mm. about tattoos yeah. that I could write a research paper on. So then it gives them five ideas, okay? Now we tell them to choose one of those ideas mm. and ask for three more ideas about that idea. Now oh, yes. it's narrow enough to do a paper. Now, once you get that paper idea down, then we run their claims through AI. Is this a good claim? Could I make mm. this a better claim? How could I make this claim better? And they have a conversation with AI. They're talking about their claims, talking about how they would outline this. But then they're asking what kind of research, what kind of secondary, we ask them very specifically, ask for secondary sources mm -hmm. that are academic within the past five years. Mm -hmm. They go into perplexity and they look for secondary sources within the past five years. So they're very specific with their research sources. So then we ask them to take those research sources and then summarize them with u.com. And I don't know if u.com, but if they mm -hmm. take any URL and they just stick it in u.com, it'll give them a summary. Wow. So summarize it. Now look at it. Now write an annotated bibliography. The first paragraph is a summary. The second paragraph of that annotated bibliography is you look at that particular source. What does that source offer you that? your five other sources don't give you? Why is it unique and why is it important to your paper? So they have to tell us why. So that type of analysis is impossible to do with AI, yeah. which is really fun. Yeah. So then after they have that down, they really know their stuff. So now they mm. can write us a paper. And that's, I'm able to spend that kind of time because I'm not, a, I don't have to talk about dangling mud fire. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> My students are really learning about the research process and about writing about research. And I can talk about how to use appeal structure and what it means and how to introduce a topic and what, why we use citation styles the way we use them and, and how to use Zotero, which I love. If you're not using Zotero, learn about it now and, okay. and teach it to your students, Z-O-T-E-R-O, -E Zotero. It's an open access, free source. It's awesome. And it also works with Google Docs. <laughs> but if you have trouble, contact me. I'll help you. <laughs> but your librarian should know a lot about it. And, and so they learn how to cite stuff. They learn how, to, how exactly to do everything. And our students are telling us, not only did I learn how to do research and how to write in this class, but I learned to be more creative. And we thought, mm. what? We weren't teaching creative writing. Yeah. But what our students said is that because they didn't have to spend all that time learning those basic things, they had time to creatively think about their topic, to really um, spread out and learn and focus. And that was just a really interesting um, thing that we learned from the projects that our students did, mm. is that we learned that they loved it because mm. they were able to really go into the meat of a topic and really learn how to write about it. And a lot of our students had been stuck in a cycle they have been stuck in the cycle of not being a good writer. So you're not a good writer. So let me give you some lessons about uh, organizing your paragraph. And they've been learning how to organize a paragraph since they were in middle school. And yeah. they were sick of it. And they were yeah. never going to learn it, not in 15 weeks. So AI took them out of that cycle. And now they can start to use their brain for something that their brain is good at, which is analysis and learning. And our, especially our ESL students. Okay, look, if you're an ESL student, that means you are taking 
college in a different language. You are freaking amazing. You are brilliant. Okay. Yeah, right. now, let's not have your syntax hold you back. Use yeah. AI. I want to hear the ideas that you have in that incredibly large brain. I could never go to Russia or Poland right. or Mexico or, or China and take a class in Chinese or Russian or, uh, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I can yeah. never, I'm not that smart. These people are brilliant. Yeah. So let's get that brilliance out and let them share it. I love that so much. And I think <laughs> my favorite line, everybody needs to go back and listen to that entire thing three more times because that's what I'm going to do too. <laughs> because there's so much in there, Michelle, so much in there. But I think the thing that I kept coming back to, and this is something that Trisha, my co-host and I talk about a lot, is that when used appropriately, generative AI in a human-centered approach makes us more creative. It allows yes. us to spend time doing the things that humans really want to do and that we are really good at and cannot be replaced by a computer because we'll take out the hanging participles to the computer. It can do that. It we can need do to that. focus on the creative stuff that we're really good at. And I just love that that's what you're doing for your students. Get that stuff out yeah. of the way and let's go be creative. Personalize learning, whatever topic you want, because every kid can have a different topic because the generative AI tool will help you create your thesis statement for whatever topic you want. I, as a teacher, don't have to go around one by one. We can do this together with generative AI supporting us in understanding how, that, how you leverage that to get a really good thesis statement or come up with a really good introductory paragraph, whatever your topic right. is. I love and that. And we have also a prompt that we give to every single one of our students, and it's how to turn generative AI into a writing tutor. Mm -hmm. So we have, they have, we have, we call it a radical, radical formative assessment. So our students cool. first read over their own topic, then they enter it into the tutoring program in generative AI, which tells them this program will not do it for them. It mm -hmm. tells them these are all the things you need to fix. Then they go through and fix it. Then they run it through again, and then they fix it again. Then they put it through peer response and the pe their peers look at it. Mm. Then they turn it into us. We don't look at it till it's been through those three processes. Wow. It's perfect by the time we see it. And yeah, it really, it, and, and it should be. Yeah. We should have perfection. Yeah. And, and this is the excitement of AI is to let your students succeed and to now, unlock them. I love that. Is this a prompt that they put like directly into ChatGPT or is this something you oh, put yeah. into custom instructions? Oh, yeah. I'll be happy to share that with you. Yes. If you would, I would love to yeah, be able to yeah. share that with Absolutely. educators. Oh, Absolutely. And then so we have them also do a grammar and punctuation one. Yeah. And what it does is it gives a, a bullet list at the end that tells all the changes that were made because they need to check and yeah. make sure AI didn't change it, the meaning of their paper right. by changing the punctuation oh. or the grammar of something. So again, it gives a bullet that, list. We're at that next higher level, right? This analytical evaluation, creative, focused right, on right. your and, tone and, and We're voice. right at the tip, oh. tippy top of that Bloom's yeah. pyramid. And we're getting them there because they've been stuck down here. Yeah. And AI is able to push them up until they can get to this tippy top level and they can really start to use their critical thinking skills. I love that. I wish we had three more hours to talk, Michelle. We're going to have you back <laughs> on so we can keep talking on this because you're just dropping knowledge everywhere. I love it. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing those prompts, that would be great. We'll make I sure those are in the show notes. Because those are the little tidbits too, I think that teachers are looking for. I'm going to, I already know that Trish and I are going to be looking at how can we help teachers structure some kind of rubric that is voice, tone, audience, transparency, accuracy. That's Efficiency. the new rubric of an ELA classroom. Yeah. I love yes, it. Yes, it is. I love it's it. Absolutely Michelle, if other people want to reach out to you, want to learn more, want to follow what you are doing, where are some great places for them to go? You should find me on my LinkedIn. I it's love Michelle it. Casorle, and I'll send that to you as well. Please do. And we'll make sure that's in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, Educators, you've been K hearing this. K-A-S-O-R-L-A. <laughs> Educators, you've been hearing this throughout this uh, mini series. LinkedIn really has become what I would say was is the new what Twitter was. Right. I think a lot of people are moving to LinkedIn. Yeah, set up your account, get over there, follow these professors, follow these instructors like Michelle, and just make that be your new professional learning hub because there's just great knowledge being dropped over there. Michelle, thank you so much for spending time with us It was with really today. great. 
It was great. I, really I hope I helped some people it. and I really appreciate the opportunity. It's awesome. Thanks so much.